Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we come before you. We give you thanks because you have given us spirits that cry out with our spirit, a spirit that cries out with our spirit, Abba, Father. We know that we can come to you with any need, Lord, yet we so often fail to. We come before you now, though, to ask for your blessing upon this study. We come to you to ask that you be with us, that you help us to trust your word so much that we can't do anything but help to pray. Pray to you, knowing that at all times the Spirit is with us, and, and even fixing our miserable prayers that are shot through with sin, you are holy and perfect, and you make those prayers holy and perfect for our sake. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so Galatians 3. We read 1 through 9, correct? I believe we're ready for 10 through 14. All right, anybody want to read Galatians 3, 10 through 14? Oh. All right. Once upon a time, Galatians, chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things tell me that it, you guys were waiting. We just read uh, Galatians 3, 10 through 14. Um, so thoughts? Don't understand it. You don't understand it. That's a good thought. Uh, a curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Well, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if somebody drags me out of here and hangs me on a tree, am I cursed? Well, no, but why? Because I believe. Because you believe in Christ. Who, was, who was hung on the tree. You believe in Jesus. Oh, who was the one. The one. Who I was cursed. Right. Well, I understand. I understand what you right. But no. See? See? The uh, scripture, I would say they're smooth, but God's smooth through them. <laughs> um, yeah, hanging on the tree, I mean, you usually think, but who is the one who hung on the tree? And because he was cursed by being hung on a tree, are you cursed? Definitely not. But Definitely he not. Wasn't I mean, he, he was, was cursed by the people down below him. Is that God cursed him. He suffered hell. If he didn't suffer hell, we wouldn't be saved. We wouldn't be saved. Right, right. He, see, remember, is that um, he who knew no sin became sin. You know, remember, know that verse? He who, he who knew no, it's not that he, See, our problem is we sin because we're sinners, right? Yes. Christ wasn't a sinner. But our sin was put onto him so that we could become righteous. Okay. So my misunderstanding is I didn't realize God cursed him. I know he went to hell, but I think he went to hell with Satan that Yes, I well, hung on the cross, but I have risen. So suffering hell, see, this is where we can get confusing if we don't talk about it. Suffering hell, and when we confess that he descended into hell in the creed, is not the same thing. Okay. He suffered hell on the cross. Okay. And then that passage from Peter about him descending to, yeah. to, to preach to the spirits in prison, 
that's that's talking about you know that descent into hell from the creed okay. so he suffered hell on the cross he said my god my god why have you forsaken me and and our trouble is scripture talks about heaven and hell in ways that we can understand but sometimes we take it in a way that it's not meant to we think of hell as a place over there you know and we think of heaven as a place over there but that's not the reality the reality is heaven is the rule and reign of god and through that rule and reign we receive grace and mercy and life because god is the source of our life that's why we call it everlasting life and what what do we call hell eternal damnation. damnation yes that's not the one i was going for but <laughs> damnation eternal death right because hell isn't this place over here hell is where god of life isn't so the people in hell aren't going to burn because they're dead i'm i'm looking at it well they're they're suffering they're they're they are suffering because they don't have yes but the goodness of god will be withdrawn from them because they don't want him does that make sense so yeah on the last day everyone's going to raise scripture says everyone is going to raise and then we will be separated <clears throat> those to eternal life and those to eternal death you mean i don't get to go up above the clouds <laughs> you you and, and yeah well that's true it says when jesus returns we'll all be lifted up to meet him in the air so there you go no you're closer though when you're here because this is the kingdom of heaven when we receive the body and blood, when we receive absolution, that is the kingdom of heaven breaking in to our time, right? You know, to our time here. Um, it, that is the kingdom of heaven invading the kingdom of darkness. Okay. That's, I I can understand. that's why we call it a sanctuary. Because that holy place is a sanctuary from the realm of darkness. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I was I was trying to if if we have this many people, I might get back to them. I just wanted to. Well, I think I told you I was trying to wait until we had more people back. I don't know at this point if we wait for everyone to be back, we might be waiting forever. So after Galatians, we might wrap up that communion. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I'm back in the old days, stung, stung, you know, tools. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And Chisel. I'm just wondering if what's coming out of the seminary is new so that I can update my knowledge. Just download it from the cloud. <laughs> you know, ah, he's not Sorry. A Sorry. <laughs> Only because you deserve it. You know, we use, and, and, and scripture does talk about hell, fire, and brimstone, mm -hmm. and all that. And the reason we do that is because a burn is the most painful of all injuries of humans because just to walk by somebody who has had a burn, the air itself. Will it's hot. Send you into yeah. But I'm not sure that that is what hell is. Hell really is being out of the presence of God. Did he not listen to a single word I said? <laughs> I disagree with you. This is the way I think it is. <laughs> Did you challenge him to go into a, in some, in case you question that? <laughs> go ahead. Go 
go into a dark room where there is no yeah. light whatsoever, there is no contact with anything around you, and at that point in time, envision you being in there without God. For eternity. Well, fortunately, you. Oh yeah, fortunately. Yeah, yeah. But For eternity. You want a, you want a little feel of what hell would be like? Put yourself in there. I'd prefer to not. And see if that doesn't. But yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it will. Hopefully. I but yeah. Was your pepper was the patron. <laughs> well, during so, the service yeah, today, didn't you read that at the end? time when Christ mm -hmm. comes, mm -hmm. the earth will be covered with fire and the graves will, the earth will crack open. Well, I hear you wrong. I mean, it was in our hymn that, that, you know, the, the fire will cover the earth and, and in our, in the parable, Jesus said, you know, they'll be taken and, and thrown into the fire. And so it does use that imagery. It does use that imagery, but... Right, right, it does. But what exactly does that look like? Uh, I don't know because, you know, he's using a parable. He specifically is using parabolic. That's not the right word. Parabolic means a parabola. He's specifically using imagery. Um, so what exactly will that look like? I have no idea. I mean, Revelation does say there's a lake of sulfur. Will there be a physical lake of sulfur? I have no idea. Not my job to know. That's, that's it's above my pay grade. <laughs> but, but we do know, as, as Pastor Irv so astutely said, yeah. um, you know, ultimately the distinguishing characteristic of hell is the lack of God's love and mercy and goodness. Okay. Uh, because... You always hear people say, well, I can't understand how a good God would send people to hell. It's not. They are choosing it for themselves because they are rejecting his life and his love and his goodness and his mercy. And he goes eventually, fine, you don't want me. You won't have me. This is the consequence of not having me. This is the price. And it's, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, so, I mean, the weight of what Christ experienced there on the cross, it's unfathomable to us. He, did, he experienced hell on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is hell. That is the curse. But God didn't leave him there. Right? He didn't abandon them there. He lifted him up. Um, so every time you hear in the Psalms, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Every time you hear in the Psalms, the psalmist say, um, you know, God, don't abandon me to Sheol. We say, yes, that is that psalmist's prayer, and it can also be our prayer, but it's that psalmist's prayer and our prayer ultimately because that's Christ's prayer. And God didn't abandon him to Sheol. He rose him up on the third day and rose him you know, he ascended into heaven and, and we will be with him for all eternity in the new creation. Um, he's not going to leave us in Sheol, in death, in eternal death. Thus, when Christians die, we say, anybody who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Anybody who believes in me will never die. Because those people, yes, their body is dead and, and they're in the grave, but their spirit is in Christ. They're not dead they are hidden in jesus the people who die outside of him they're dead because their body's dead and their spirit is suffering that that experience of being without god's goodness and mercy and love and graciousness and etc cetera, etc cetera. which is what christ experienced on the cross for us so we don't have to and that's that's what that all is about. Does that make Does that help? I just don't want to wake up in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, you can pray. <laughs> Kurt had something. I was just going to say, I'm a big believer in history.
It's simple. Exactly. Trust his goodness and his wisdom. Trust his goodness and his wisdom. Just one. It might go on for 10 minutes, but just. I want you to think about it. Think about it forever. Jesus does a great job of explaining it in the parable of Lazarus and Abraham. And the rich man was there. He wanted to. Can you get him to dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue? Yeah, just my, just even my tongue. And he could see that Lazarus was there, so that in that vision, it looks like yes, we could see that yeah. they're there in a great place, and he's being comforted. But yeah, he can't go there. Much you can't go there. Can't go back and tell my family. Right. 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 Well, I mean, and that, I mean, that's a that's a good story. And I think there's a lot more in that story than we realize. Um, but I mean, that point ultimately is Jesus says at the end. Or Abraham says to Lazarus or to the rich man, they're not gonna if if they're not gonna believe Moses and the prophets, they're not gonna believe if someone would rise again and tell them. I wonder who Jesus was referring to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So any other thoughts, questions? I think I'm, I'm more and more convinced we need, to, we need to understand the full weight of when he says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. I mean, he's been hitting this, nailing us with this from the beginning of Galatians. And it's because it's so important. Don't trust yourself. Don't. For anything. At all, period. Don't say, if I don't, God won't. No. Just stop it. If I'm not, no. But I got it, no. Just stop. What has been left undone that Christ did not accomplish on the cross? Not a thing. Don't go there. Don't. Because Christ has done it for you, and he didn't suffer hell so that it would still be left up to you. He didn't. Pastor, uh, for our Catholic friends, for our Catholic even, friends. and it's good for us to think about too. Your wife? <clears throat> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> but it's okay. But they must have a problem believing. Done by oh, absolutely. And pray to get them on in. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's why. The rosary. Well, that, that quarter Lutheran is what's going to save her, so. <laughs> um, but, 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 yeah. There you go. Um, but, I mean, the Catholic Mass, you know, celebrating the Lord's Supper, it is a re-sacrifice. They, when the priest does his thing, you know, when he's saying the, the words of institution, it's not in the same way that we say the words of institution. We, be we believe that this is, you know, now Christ's body and blood because of his word of promise. In the Catholic Mass, they literally are saying that that they are re-sacrificing Christ. So that Christ is being sacrificed over and over and over and over again. Did you guys learn that when you were? No, I do. Okay. They weren't, paying attention. Nope. they weren't paying attention in there. They go to eight years of yeah. school, but. <laughs> um, but yeah, because, well, if, I, if these sins are going to be forgiven, Christ has to be re-sacrificed. And you go, wait a minute, no, no, no. It is finished. Is Jesus a liar? But you know, no, I still, you know, Catholics have the central belief of Christ. And that's what's going to save them. That's what's going to save them. Uh, right. And, and God right. Just you only just pointed to her when you first started talking. <laughs> but you know, they don't know this Bible stuff. They don't. Uh, read a 
I'd suggest you, because I can see her face. <laughs> well, that's one thing that the Catholics do. I love you, Scott. Because you go to confession to the priest, and the priest right. says, three are our fathers and six Hail Marys, and you'll be forgiven. Right, right. So I had, to go to Christ. I had someone a couple weeks ago after service, they asked me, uh, could I have confession? And I was like, I said, do you, do you want, well, actually we didn't that day because it was the day of the baptism. Um, so I, it just threw me off for a second. Cause I was like, confession, are you wanting like a small catechism or something? <laughs> I just, it went over my head for a second until I realized what they were talking about because I'm so used to confession and absolution, you know, hearing it in that way and finding out she has Catholic in her background. So, so I said, I realized, oh yeah, I'd be happy to. I said, but I just want you to know that after you confess your sins, I'm forgiving your sins. I'm not telling you that you have to go make satisfaction for them. She was like, perfect. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, but, Yes, sir. Now give the reform equal time. Okay. Jesus. What what reformed equal time do you want to give? For communion. The Jesus isn't there? Part? You don't tell me. You tell I'm asking you if that's what you... <laughs> so, so, okay. So I was trying to talk about Galatians, but I already got us off track. And I'll let us get off track even more. Communion, communion does. Sure. So we believe, so as Lutherans, we believe Christ is there in the body and the blood. Why? Because he says he is. We're not re-sacrificing him because it is finished. We are receiving the benefits through his body and blood in the bread and the wine. Again, why? Because he said so. Well, I guess this can tie into the Catholic part because during the Reformation, the, the Reformed, which came after the Lutheran, they, the Reform Reformation came because they didn't think Lutherans went far enough because we didn't outright reject Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. Um, and they said, no, everything about Rome is wrong. Therefore, we need to, to figure out new things. And in doing so, they said, well, this whole body and blood of Jesus and bread and wine doesn't make sense. Therefore, it's just nonsense. It's something that, the, that Rome made up in order to keep people under power because you have to have the body and blood. Um, and so Reformed traditions just, you know, don't believe that Christ is actually in the bread and the wine because it doesn't make rational sense to us. Of course, if you're basing your belief of faith on what makes rational sense. That where he is going? But see, he wasn't around in the 50s and 60s. Some of us went out. Oh, no. And yeah. I can remember on the campus of Wayne State University Wayne State. having Holy Communion with. Oh, Coke and Doritos? And yeah. Because why does it matter? All it is is a, a, it, meal. a meal of remembrance. It, it has no, no power whatsoever. So if it's only a meal of remembrance, the important part is that we're remembering. Therefore, we can remember with Coke and chips. But we say, no, Christ made a promise. And he said, this wine is my blood. This bread is my body. Therefore, we go, oh, we're supposed to use bread and wine, like Jesus did. He instituted it. Didn't I explain that to you? With, uh, uh, Didn't I explain that to you? I th think you mentioned to me that you... I don't remember what you said. <laughs> Notice I said, I think you did. I remember the conversation. Stand up. It's a wall. I know I'm short. 
I'll mimic you so they can see it on. The difference between this and if you go to your Greek text. All of you. And, and I, I hate to agree with them, but he's absolutely right. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. Now, in Greek language, if I do this, what am I saying? Now, do I add the verb is? No, because it's understood. It's the same way in Greek. Right. But for the emphasis, there is a word in Greek which is is. <laughs> and when you check it in your Greek, it says this is. My God, he didn't leave it to be just red ball, body blood. It is. So it's there. And, and, and he, he hits yeah. it with such emphasis right. so that there is no doubt in our minds when you're reading the Greek, this is. Right. No yeah. question. Yeah. Takes away any doubt that you might have about whether or not this is his body and this is his blood. What grade you get I passed. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> a passing one. Is that better? A passing one. Um, but yeah, so I mean, so yeah, the, the way Greek works is. When you're normal, average speaking, he boy, you know, she girl, son bright, you know, that they're, you don't have to use, they don't ordinarily use a, a to be verb. So when they do, it's, hey, pay attention to this verb. It's emphatic, as the wise one said. <laughs> He's wise because he has that long white beard. <laughs> so, so yeah, so Christ said this is. That leaves me with one question. Yes, sir. Okay. Greek to Greek? Uh, well, have other people heard the gospel message? And what did they do with yeah. it? Yeah. Well, that's true. So they did. Well, read it. And what did they do with it? The same thing these people Well, right. I, assume, I assume, I know that's a bad word, that they were people of, shall we say, learned people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And you would think that they would explore that possibility. But 10 learned people read. So have 10 well, people but here's, here's another trap of learned people. And I say this thinking I'm learned. Here's a trap of learned people. Well, it just doesn't make sense to me. Therefore, that can't be what it means. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I was having a conversation a couple years ago with a brother in the ministry who's not Lutheran. Um, and we were reading through First Peter chapter 3. And we read the verse, baptism now saves you not as a washing of, wa of dirt off the body with water, but as a, as a clean appeal to God for a good conscience. And we read that, and he goes, yeah, but the Bible never says that baptism saves you. I was like, dude, that is literally the words on the page. That is literally the words on the page. And he goes, but, that, but that's not what it means, because that can't be what it means, because that doesn't make sense. How can water, and this is, this is where our mind, how can water give me eternal life? I mean, come on. Right. It's not about the water. It's about the word, the promise that when I pour this water on your forehead or submerge you or whatever, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that that is God working through that very thing to bring you to life everlasting, adopting you as his eternal child, 
That is why we say baptism saves, not because you had some water dumped on your head, but because through that water and through the word, God made it so. Thus, the Lord's Supper. The body and blood are in with and under the bread and wine. What does that mean? I have no idea, but it sounds good. That's why we say it, honestly. In with and under, sounds good. But how is Christ present? I don't know. I just know he is because Christ said so. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. But if now, in my husband's test, I don't cook. It's not cooking food. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you said just that. like just, just like Pastor's Doritos, if it's bread and wine, why don't we have bread? Why do we have a host? Well, the host just means the bread, the wafer is what you're asking. But they're saying that the Doritos. Right, but the wafers are bread. Okay. So they are bread. That's where cooking yeah, comes yeah. in. Which, okay. is, which is why we have gluten-free wafers okay. for, for people who can't have, I mean, we don't have a lot, but yeah. who people who it really, that's why we have gluten-free. Because it is bread. It doesn't look like bread. Okay. It doesn't taste much like bread. But the host nowadays is more for modern conveniences. Yeah. So I'll throw it out there. We've done it before. If anybody wants to make unleavened bread for our <laughs> if anybody wants to make unleavened bread to have for a Sunday service for communion, I'll be more than happy to use it. Marie did that once because I realized we didn't have any wafers and it was Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> they are tiny. They well, it's so weird. The the companies will change, and there's different stuff that's available at different times, and so I click whatever's available. <laughs> but Jesus is there. The fullness of Him is there. But all right. So, any other questions on that, or back on Galatians, the four verses we've read? Yes, Lynn. Do you want an actual theological answer or do you want the best answer I can give you? Best answer I can give you is because they want the wine for themselves. I really don't know. <laughs> I really don't know for sure. I think, if I remember, I think it came from, well, if you didn't know, I spilt the wine this morning. There's wine all <laughs> there's wine all over our altar right now because I spilt the wine. And I think that's exactly why, because it's so easy to spill the wine that the less chance that you take with it, because it's the blood of Christ. And we want to be reverent. And there's a difference between reverence and legalism. Um, I feel bad that I spelt the wine, but I'm not going to try to suck it up out of the, the linens um, because I know with God there is forgiveness. And so we'll clean it. But if a priest did that, he, he would stop the service and they and he would deal have with to it. bless it and well, deal with it. Huh. And they offer. They do offer? They off so after 500 years, I was just informed after 500 years after our Lutheran confession said the lady should get both the bread and the wine, the popes finally listened. <laughs> How long ago do you know? Or is it on a church by church kind of basis? Most churches do it now. I think the last time I went to a family wedding, they only did the bread. I might want to Google Three it. Years ago, they Three years ago? No, because I was at a service. 
<laughs> there you go. I would never say that. You have learned a lot today. I'm glad. I'm glad. As long as we learn, even if we only go over four verses, as long as we learn something. All right. Any other? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. so, Under the curses, everyone who does not yeah. abide. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the law, as we will see as we continue in, in Galatians, the law was given as the guardian so that we know what God's will is. Well, if you don't listen to God's will, what's the only thing left for you? Death. Curse. So do we ever get confused between trying to keep the law and trying to do God's will? Oh, I think we do that all the time. Too. All the time. Well, like I said, many of you I don't think were here. I don't remember if it was last week or the week before. The questions and answers in the back of the catechism, not the catechism itself, but the questions and answers in the back of the catechism pull that, oh, well, Christ fulfilled the, the civil and the ceremonial law, but not the moral law. I'm, I'm sorry, that is a Lutheran doctrine that, or document that we used to teach our kids that isn't in accord with, with Scripture and, and our Lutheran confessions. And those questions and answers that in the back that I'm referring to are LCMS produced, not Lutheran reformer produced. Um, if we have any part of it, for those who rely on works of the law are under a curse. If we say, no, Jesus fulfilled this part of the law, but we're still obligated to this part of the law, we're all, not excuse my language because I'm using it appropriately, damned. We are all damned. And this is why Paul keeps face punching them in the face with the gospel. Um, you know, he, over and over and over here in Galatians, it is not by the law. It is by Christ. And thus, as ones who are now alive in Christ, we want to do the will of our Father, but we're not under the law anymore. And he'll, he'll get to that in Galatians. We're not going to steal because that's not going to get us to heaven because God doesn't want us to Right, because stealing, stealing is hurtful. It's harmful. It leads to death. So as children of life, why would we want to steal? And when we do, we understand, we go with Paul, oh, that's not... That's not the law. That, that's the sin within me. And that sin I need to take back to Christ to, to have it crucified so that he may raise me and forgive me and strengthen me so I don't want to do that anymore. Right. Or if I have broken it, so that I repent. You know, we have a, was it Matthew? Who... You know, when Christ came to him, he said, oh, man, if I've robbed from anybody, I'm going to repay them fourfold. You know, if he was obeying the law, he would say, OK, I'll give back what I stole. But he's not obeying the law. He's understanding, oh, my goodness, God has done it everything for me. Therefore, all the wrongs that I've done, I'm not only going to make right, I'm going to be gracious I'm going to give back more than I took because I understand the graciousness of God. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he's not doing it to justify his sins. He's doing it because he understands he did wrong and he wants to make it right, but not only just by, by equal, you know, old Testament eye for an eye. He's gone, man, I took $5, but I'm going to give him $25 because he finally understood just what it is about sin and about salvation. So, and, and you know, Galatians is all about this, so we'll keep running into this. Uh, earlier in? Yeah. Because Paul was trying to, or Peter was trying to act 
you know, like the, the cozy up to the, the law abiders, uh, the circumcisionists. And Paul said, what are you doing? Because, and why is Paul so mad about that? That was in chapter two. Why was Paul so mad about that? Because you're misleading people, Peter. You're misleading people to believe that their works are required for salvation. Because what was the circumcision party trying to do? They were trying to tell people, unless you follow the law of Moses, specifically unless you are circumcised, you cannot be a follower of Jesus and receive salvation. And Paul is saying, Peter, what are you doing? Knock it off. Tell, put them in their place. Tell them the truth. What they are doing is wrong. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it isn't good to know that Peter is still a sinner, too. <laughs> so... Paul is also a sinner. He all he calls himself a sinner all the time. But but yeah, and this is I mean this is why Paul gets so ramped up because Paul tried to live by the law even more than Peter did. He was a zealot of zealots. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And yet he realized he despaired once Christ intervened and he realized what he was doing and went That's not the way to go. And that's the same comfort. Yeah. And, and honestly, this is not an insult to anyone. But I've almost noticed that most of the faithful Lutherans are people who weren't born Lutherans. It's because they lived, well, you have that story about um, people you brought through the adult catechesis who were Reformed tradition, and once they finally came and went through with you in the scriptures and realized, wait, you mean God gave himself to me? This is the body and blood of Jesus for me? And had tears in their eyes when they first finally received. It's not that they never had the Lord's Supper before, but when they finally realized what they were receiving, they had tears in their eyes. And people who went without and finally come to the, to the gospel to understand that the truth of the gospel in its weight, they're not going to give it up easily. Paul was, Peter, knock it off. You foolish Galatians. Why are you being so out of your minds? Stop it. Bullheaded. Bullheaded. There you go. Zealous. So he was zealous for the law, and once he realized how wrongheaded he was, bullheaded he was, he was zealous for that gospel. And you don't dare take that assurance and hope away from anyone. And when you grow up in a different system, when you finally come and understand, Christ did it all. But I got it. No, Christ did it all. But I still know Christ did it all. So you mean there's nothing left for me to do? Yes. Now rest in his peace. Live as a child of God. And, that, I mean, and, and if you haven't lived under one, to understand the freedom and blessing of the other, it's hard to appreciate. It's hard to appreciate. Um, but yeah. Pastor in verse 14. Yes. To the blessing of Abraham. Yes. What is that? Um, that in the world, that the world might through Abraham be blessed. You know, God made that promise that your offspring will, be, will number more than the stars, and the whole world will be blessed through your offspring. Yes. Which, of course, in Jesus. The whole world was blessed through his offspring. And the descendants of Abraham by the flesh were, of course, many. But soon as Christ died and, and the Gentiles were grafted in. So the descendants of Abraham were just Jews? 
Um, well, that's what that's what the Jews thought. But then, until Christ came and says, "No, the children of Abraham are children according to the promise." You think you're safe because you say we have Abraham as our father, but God will make these stones cry out. You know, if you don't speak, God will make the stones cry out. It's it's the lineage is according to the promise which is why it's so important. The promise is literally everything. If we're talking as Christians and things aren't flowing out of Jesus and coming back to Jesus, then we're not living in the life that we've been given to live. You know, which is why we, we receive forgiveness and we go out there and we live and then we come back because we know we need more forgiveness. And we receive it, and we repent, and we go, and, and we come back, and, and we have this ever, never-ending cycle. We had it in our Old Testament. I am, the, I am the first, and I am the last. The Alpha, the Omega. He's not just saying that. He's not making some theoretical point. This is the reality. Live in me. Start your day with me. End your day with me. Throughout the day, pray to me. This is how you live. Not, well... Didn't kill anyone today. You know, um, that's, that's not how we live. We live by, yeah, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And in Luther's morning prayer, what does he say? Please help me not to sin today. His evening prayer, what does he say? Please forgive me of all my sin today. You know, and then keep me through the night. Thank you for keeping me through the night. Help me to not sin. Forgive my sin. Keep me through the night. And it's the endless cycle over and over and over. Because we're living in Christ, not under the law. Because when you sin, can the law help you? No. What is the, when you sin, what does the law do? It curses you. That's why we go, thanks be to God, we are not under the law, but we are under grace and peace in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we did not deserve it. All right. Any final parting thoughts? That's why I asked for final parting thoughts. That's the cue of it better be short. I just have a favor to ask. Okay. I forgot to ask this in church. My brother... Mike Weber has been sick since February, and his doctor had been flown to New York to deal with the ICU unit for COVID and just got back, and my brother has just been tested. He does not know the results yet, but the doctor has said that he's 95% sure Mike has been suffering from COVID since mm. February. Since February? He's still not. Where's she at? Well, in Oregon. Outside in Salem, Oregon. 30 miles south. Oh, my. Well, how about we pray and we'll include Mike in our prayers. Okay. Let's pray. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have given to us your word. Your word of promise and hope. Help us to resist that, that sinful part of us that wants to be responsible, that wants to reach out like Adam and Eve and grab, grab the fruit for themselves. Instead, let us bear the fruit that you would have us to give. And Lord, we come before you now trusting in your goodness and your wisdom and your mercy to bring Mike before you. Lord, he's been long-suffering, and we know that, that you promise that those who, who suffer they will be redeemed as long as they hope and trust in you. Let Mike's faith be strengthened as he looks at the weeds of this world. Let his faith be strengthened so that he may receive that blessed assurance that he may know without a doubt that you are there, that you are with him, and that you are holding him in your hand. Bring him through, Lord. And if it be your will, please heal him so he no longer has to face this suffering. It is in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.